Namaste and welcome to the Festival of Bharat. My name is Divya Shishalda, your host. At the Festival of Bharat, we believe in having insightful discussions on anything and everything related to Bharat and our precious Indian culture. And with this, I would like to warmly welcome a very special guest for today's show, Ambassador Deepak Bhuhra ji. Ambassador Deepak Bhuhra ji is a special advisor to the Prime Minister of Lesotho, South Sudan. Guinea Bissau and the special advisor to Ladakh Autonomous Hill Development Councils Lay and Kargil uh, Ambassador ji namaste and welcome to the show Namaskar and thank you very much thank you very kind of you So uh, Deepak ji what has been the diplomatic standing of India post 2014 on an international scale how has it changed Right. First of all, thank you very much for this opportunity to interact with you and with the millions of people, sons and daughters of India, and Literally of the world who are who are watching this program. You've introduced me as a special advisor, which is correct. I served as India's ambassador to six countries in Africa, and I've served in several others in a junior diplomat's capacity. Uh, I've also acted, by the way, in commercial films, and they were all super flops. So I made a career in diplomacy. Considered universally to be the handsomest ambassador that India has ever had, and uh, the smartest secretary general that the United Nations has never had. You've asked me an interesting question about where we are today in terms of our diplomatic stature since 2014. Let me begin. Uh, take you back a little bit. Hello. Let me begin with the big challenge that we are facing today which as you know is the second attack of the Chinese virus. We were not prepared, we stumbled, but we have quickly regained control. Yes. Because ma'am when the going gets toughest the Indians get going. And in April last month Prime Minister Narendra Modi told chief minister If we work together, our resources won't look scarce. Just as we clobbered virus one with an all-of-country approach and united effort, we'll do it with virus two. We've faced many challenges to our health in the past, and this is for all those people watching this podcast. You recall we vanquished smallpox and diphtheria and AIDS and poliomyelitis. and your skin disease and maternal and neonatal tetanus all this we defeated people said india will collapse we didn't dr anthony fauci says and this was two days ago on the first of may to india hang in there help each other things will go back to normal sons and daughters of india of course they will keep the faith let me put it to you like this in the new post virus world the big four will determine the future of our planet and from today we will measure time and eons not in terms of before the christian era or christian era but in terms of bc before covid and ac after covid the big four countries the first will be the united states which is in self correct mode an amazing ability to bounce back india our rise is unstoppable russia which is hurting very badly and china which is badly cornered and is barking so what's going to be the convergence in our brave new world today on everybody's mind they're not worried about producing motor cars or buying televisions or going to the moon what we are worried about is healthcare we are worried about climate stability we are worried about open sea lanes this is these are the three trends that will define our new world health medical expertise infrastructure we are considered the world's pharmacy and people are laughing that look the pharmacy of the world can't take care of its own health of course we can't because we have sent 80 million doses of our vaccine to other countries not that we would not have done it we do it because that is our philosophy to help others china sent its visiting card to 200 countries the visiting card said virus we sent ours it said vaccine You know, China has given an example of its power, Miss Sharda, to hurt. We have shown the power of our example to heal. 
the UN Secretary General said that India's vaccine production capacity, he said this in January 2021, is the best asset of the world. And he thanked us for gifting vaccines to UN peacekeepers. I personally believe we deserve the Nobel Peace Prize for what we've done. The second issue is climate change. This can destroy human civilization as we know it. Rich nations have gone slow on meeting their climate change commitments that they made under the 2015 Paris Agreement. We've taken up the slack and we've increased our own voluntary commitments. An example, we talked about restoration of degraded land from, uh, from uh, of 21 million hectares. We voluntarily increased that to 26 million hectares. And when we talked about producing so many billion gigawatts of new and renewable energy, we met our promise three years ahead of schedule. That is in there. Trade is the engine of poverty alleviation for which we need open seas. In the 16th and 17th century, when the British, the French, the Germans, the Belgians, the Spanish went around conquering the whole world, dominating the whole world, they didn't go by train or by plane or by cars. There was none of this stuff at that time. They went by sea. And there was no one to stop them from going with the seas are the common heritage of all mankind. China was able to lift hundreds of millions out of poverty through open sea lanes, but now wants to control and close them. So the Indo-Pacific region, which is not India and the Pacific, but the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean, has to be kept open. Now, who can ensure an open Indian Ocean? We can, and I'll tell you why. World militaries today, 2021, not my figures. You can check them on Global Firepower Index and Credit Suisse. Number one, the most powerful military in the world today, USA. Please have no doubt about it. They spend more on defense than the next 20 countries put together. They're a democratic nation. Second is Russia. Is Russia democratic? You decide. Third is India. Third most powerful military in the world. Not my figure. Are we democratic? Huh. Nobody has ever told me that we are not. And the fourth is China. Are they democratic? If you think China is democratic, then please believe me that Abraham Lincoln is my grandfather. How are we confident that India can play its destined role? Because India has children like those who celebrate the festival of Bharat, like the young lady who's talking to me now. We have the third largest economy in the world. Trust in India is at an all-time high. We win every international election most comfortably. No one trusts China. I would urge you to look at the 2021 Edelman Trust Barometer. 33,000 respondents across 28 countries. Even Chinese citizens are losing trust in their government. And of course, the results were banned in China. China thinks like a certain fellow called Joseph Goebbels during Hitler's time. Tell lies often enough and people might begin to take them as the truth. So, ma'am, in our new world, hyper-technology will drive everything. What is hyper-technology? Engineered intelligence, machine learning, deep learning, industry four. The first industrial revolution was when the steam engine came around and we went in for mass production. The second one, we went in for faster production. The third, we went in for automatic production. And now we are going in for autonomous production, which is what artificial or engineered intelligence will do. Who adapts to new technology easier? A young person like me or a slightly older person like me, Shraddha? Nations with abundant, educated young minds will lead. Take a look at demographies. One out of three Japanese is above 60 years. One out of four Europeans, one out of six Chinese, and one out of 12 Indians. When I was studying at the University of the Sorbonne in Paris, the historian Alfred Servi, God rest his soul, predicted that Europe would become a society of old people living in old houses, discussing old ideas. And the Pope, a few years ago, said, Europe is an elderly and haggard continent. I didn't say it. He did. Take a look at the youthification of India, the oldification of the developed world. We have a thing called the demographic window of opportunity, sons and daughters of India, which means that if you are between 15 and 64, you 
produce more than you consume. Less than 14, above 65, you consume more than you produce. The median age, which means half the population is below that, half is above that for India, is 29 in 2021. China, 39. Russia, 40. Japan is 47. It's the oldest country in the world. They've forgotten how to make babies. We can teach them. We have the technology. We may not be a productive society. We are a reproductive society. Western Europe is 44. You can imagine the great advantage this gives us. And an educated young mind? Look at the focus on education in India. I don't know how many of you have read the Mahabharata. If you haven't, please do. One of the major protagonists is Yudhishthira. Four of his brothers wandering in the forest fall senseless when they drink from a pond. And the guardian spirit says, first answer my questions. They don't. They're so thirsty. Along comes Yudhishthira, the eldest brother. And then the spirit says, what is the most valuable possession? Without hesitating, Yudhishthira says, education. 10,000 years ago. Ladies and gentlemen, we were talking of education while these guys who preached to us were running around naked in the jungles. In 1950, we had 500 universities and colleges. Today, we have 50,000. Yes, I know we don't have them amongst the top 10, the top 50, the top 100 in the universe, etc. But we are able to offer university education to anybody who wants it. Now, I have 1.5 million schools. By the way, as much as is the population of the United States, roughly 340 million, 330 million, we have 340 million students in India today. And just over half, just over half, just over half, Ms. Sada, are our daughters. Look at it. You want to give me a lecture on women's empowerment? Happy birthday. Do so. From 10% in 1947, our literacy is over 85% today. Probably next year will be 100%. U.S. President Barack Obama, it was in October 2013, told American children after visiting India, I've seen billions of people from India who are competing with you directly, working every day to out-educate and out-compete us. So he came to India twice during his tenure. And once again, he came in December 2018. Now, I don't know why he's come so many times. Maybe he has a friend here. We should try and find out. This is the reality of India. May I also now tell you about the years of our humiliation. I'm pushing 70, so I know what we have been through. 1951, four years after our independence, we got a wheat loan of 2 million tons from the USA. We did not have enough agricultural production. By 1956, our foreign exchange reserves had collapsed. 1965, 1967, we fought a war. There was drought. We devalued our currency. Mrs. Gandhi went to the USA in 1966 to seek food aid. An American newspaper said, new Indian leader comes begging. Can you imagine our humiliation? We made the largest imports of wheat in the history of mankind. Nine and 11 million tons. Some people live hand to mouth. We were living ship to mouth. And we were told, don't eat dinner on Mondays to conserve cereal. Sons and daughters of India, ask me what hunger is. 52 Mondays, for all of 1966, I have slept hungry. Not because we couldn't afford food on the table, but we decided as a family that we would participate in the national effort. Then Mrs. Gandhi told her secretary, India will never beg for food again. There is an African proverb that if your wife has to go to the neighbor's house to beg for food, you are only half a man. She said, we will never beg for food again. And in 2021, India is the second largest producer of food grains in the world. 1970s, 1980s, oil price shocks. We were in very bad shape. By 1991, we had less than $2 billion in our treasury. We needed a loan of $600 million. And our best friends, the Brits and the Swiss, said, we don't trust your economy mortgage your gold. So we mortgaged 150 tons of our gold. I remember walking into my boss's office and sobbing on his shoulder, saying, is this the country I'm working for? He put his arm around my shoulder and said, Deepak, this too will pass. And your country today sits on over $600 billion of foreign exchange reserves. It was in the 1990s that India's comprehensive national spirit found its fullest expression. 
I don't even want to talk about mobile telephones, the metro, the Aadhaar card, etc. The IT province of India's companies, you all remember the Y2K bug, how we sorted it out. One of the proudest moments was, for me, was when Tata's acquired Jaguar Land Rover, which is now India. Space technology, we are the best in the world. And from 2003, we do not take foreign aid. 2004, the tsunami, we handle it totally ourselves. In fact, we helped other countries. We were the leaders in this. We mobilized 32 ships and 5,500 sailors in less than 48 hours. And they went off to Sri Lanka, to Indonesia, to Maldives, wherever they were required to go, to Bangladesh, to Myanmar, to help. 2019, we smoked the terrorists out of their holes in POK and in Pakistan. And if I may say something in India, Amari fitrat hai, as our prime minister said, mujhe satauge, to marunga. That is what we proved to the world. Last year in 2020, we smashed China's nose. He is running scared of us. And in 2021, we have healed the world with our vaccine. We had the Swachh Bharat movement, which eliminated open defecation. We had the Beti Bachao, Beti Parao movement. We had digital economy. I would urge you to read a book published three years ago by an American diplomat, Alisa Iris. The book is called Our Time Has Come. Bill Gates, I'm sure you've heard of this character. In December 2020, at the Singapore FinTech, he said, if people are going to study one country right now, look at India. Things are really exploding there, and innovation around that system is phenomenal. You know, we're supposed to be a poor country. Our total private wealth is US dollars 8.2 trillion. A trillion has 12 zeros, the sixth largest in the world. According to Global Wealth Migration Review, we're just behind the UK and Germany. And what are we spending it on? Hmm. Number one, we are spending it on looking better, ma'am, Ms. Sadler. I'm sure you go to a beauty parlor. I do indeed. I go to get my hair cut. Unfortunately, my barber is closed because of the lockdown in the nation's capital. So please excuse my unruly hair. I'm not, and normally, it's I'm much better quaffed, as they would say. So we spend a lot of money. That's why we win every Miss Universe, Miss World title. By the way, we have 650,000 towns, villages, and cities in India. And I have 1.5 million beauty parlors. Then we are eating better. Uh, well, we have McDonald's, and we have Domino's, and we have Zwiggy, Piggy, and we have uh, Zomato, Tomato, whatever. That's not eating better, but it certainly people have the opportunity and are the option to eat whenever they want by not cooking at all. We are living better, traveling better, communicating better. We are feeling better. And of course, we are studying better. Rising global profile. 2015, yoga resolution. We introduced it in the UN. It was co-sponsored by 177 out of 193 UN members. Largest ever. The largest in, human, in UN history. I was listening to the speeches and a European ambassador said, my country supports the yoga resolution because India is the spiritual mother of all mankind. What a beautiful thing to say. In July 2015, we evacuated thousands of nationals from 41 countries from Yemen. We were the only countries allowed to do so. The only country. In fact, the Yemenis said no British, no French, no Germans, no Italians, no Americans, no Russians, no Chinese, the Indians, because we trust them. That same year I was in France in November, the French immigration officer at Charles de Gaulle Airport, he looked at my passport. He said, Ambassador of India. I said, yes, I am indeed. And he said, well, you brought 200 Frenchmen out of Yemen. I said, if we made a mistake, we'll take them back. He smiled at me and he said, thank you, India. 1969, Sons and Daughters of India was not easy for us. We were invited to the founding conference of what became the Organization of Islamic uh, Cooperation. We went there, but then we were not allowed to attend the function because Pakistan threw a fit. We were thrown out. And then 50 years later, when they had their 50th anniversary, we were invited to their foreign ministers conference in UAE as guest of honor. Pakistan said, if India comes, we will not attend. And we're told, we don't want you to attend. You stay home. Of course, they came running there and waited outside till we had finished. Yes, of course, we are poor and starving. In September 2019, your prime minister goes to 
Vladivostok for the Eastern Economic Forum. And when he hears that Russia is facing foreign exchange pressure because of Western sanctions, your country offers a billion dollar loan, one billion dollar soft loan to the people of Russia. Because the Soviet Union, the Russians had stood by us, we stand by them. When anybody is in trouble, the helping hand that reaches out first is that of our country, ladies and gentlemen. Some of you might remember the 1999 Kargil conflict. And I'll tell you a true story. This young boy went to register for the army. He was lame in both legs. He had lost both his legs below the knee because of a train accident. When he was told politely that, son, you are physically challenged, you can't join the army, his response was classic. He said, I have come to fight the enemy, not to run away from the enemy. Look at the spirit of India, sons and daughters of India, who can stop us? We are destined to go higher and higher. I'll tell you a personal story. In September 2011, there was a massive earthquake in Sikkim and the road between Gangtok, the capital of Sikkim, and Siliguri, that's the highway, which is the lifeline of Sikkim, was broken in 300 places. Landslides, the mountain broke, took the road with it. Well, I went there with my team from our national television network, Doordarshan, to report on relief and rescue efforts. 300 places. We asked some international companies, how long will it take to repair the broken road in 300 spots? They said the earliest would be six weeks. We couldn't wait six weeks. So we asked the Indian Border Roads Organization, can you do it? They said, let's do a survey and we'll come back to you. And as I sit before you, as I speak to you, believe me, 19 hours later, their director general called and said, the road is open. Six weeks and 19 hours. This is the spirit of India. We can do it. Some of these kids who were working on the roads in Sikkim on repairing them because we were going at breakneck speed, some died tragically. They fell into the ravines, into the rivers and so on. One of them, I went to visit their home. Uh, there was a 55-year-old Sikkimese woman. I went to her and I said, sister, I'm extremely sorry about what has happened, but whatever our national network is paying us for this documentary. We are giving it to you. I wrote her a personal check. The military, the border road, Sikkim government, everybody will give you compensation. You won't lack for money. Anything else I can do? She said, yes. My elder son worked for border roads. He died for India. I have a younger child. Can you get him a job in border roads? Because when the time comes, let him also die for India. You know, as the water rushed to my eyes, I held her hands in mine, and in Hindi I said to her, Ma Tujhe Salah. If I'm ever born in India again, I would like it to be from the womb of a mother like you. From childhood sons and daughters of India, I have wondered why we are Indians. And then I got my answer from this woman. We're not Indians because we live in India. We are Indians because India lives in us. 15% of the world that ruled the other 85% for 200 years, now they face disruption, depression, loneliness. The developed countries, the old world, UK even has a minister for loneliness. They claim to have 9 million lonely people, many of them rich widows. I said, can I come to help? They said, well, um, we are lonely, but we're not that lonely. Deloitte carried out an attitude survey 2020 of millennials and Gen Z, born between 1983 and 2003, who are now coming of age. 43 countries. Indians, the most optimistic and positive. Top priority, nice house, lovely marriage, uh, good job, big car, but more than that, make an impact on society. And Goldman Sachs says that India's story will be one of the most compelling in the world. It will be shaped by India's 450 million Gen Z. Never, never, never again, Mishada, for too long have others written India's destiny. We remember our past. We made mistakes. Never, never again. We will make a commitment to ourselves. We will write our future ourselves. No one else will write it for us. I touch my ears. I ask God to forgive me for daring to suggest that we will write our future ourselves. If you ever get a chance to go to Kargil, in this beautiful part of India called Ladakh, 
you see a little tombstone. I built it myself. It has my name. It's at the foot of a statue, a huge statue of the Buddha. Kargil is a Muslim area. There's a magnificent statue of the Buddha hewn into the hillside. It says Deepak Vora, India. 1951, the year I was made in India to eternity. And below that, in my own hand, it says, scattered in the dust, silent I remain. When India's bugle calls, I will rise again. When one of my principals saw it, his eyes watered and he said, does this man love his country so much? And he was told, he has only one country, sir. He gives it all his love. So as an Indian, have faith and confidence in yourselves. Do not allow cynicism to affect you. You are born an Indian. It's a lottery of birth. Are dar se aage bado, kyunki dar ke aage jeet hai. Somebody once asked a fakir, I want to change the world. How do I do it? And the fakir said, begin with yourself. Be the change you want to see. That fakir's name was Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi. We are not God's sons and daughters of India. We are Indians. And that's the next best thing. Of course, we can do it. We are Indians. Every two seconds, we built one toilet. The world was skeptical. We did it. We are free of open defecation. Every hour, we are building one and a half kilometers of world-class highway, despite the violence. Every second, we open two bank accounts. We have the fastest elimination of extreme poverty ever in democracy. We are lifting one Indian out of extreme poverty, despite the impact on our economy of the virus, every 1.5 seconds. Yes, we are doing it. We are incredible. We are chafing, churning, changing at 74. We are in puberty. We are nonstop in there. We keep moving. Swami Vivekananda said 125 years ago that the future India must be much greater than ancient India because India is awakening. May I just say that if you had fallen asleep, would you please wake up? Because I am convinced, I am convinced that God must be Indian. And here is something you might want to listen to. We are the best. The others are the rest. Or it nai mein kahunga, for those who speak Hindi, stay with us. Abhi to party shuru hui hai. I trust I've answered your question and a lot more besides Mishada. Definitely, sir. And listening to you speak is so wonderful. How beautifully you. you have put across such patriotic sentiments towards our beautiful country. And with such pride, with such honor, and with such love for the nation, it's truly heartening to see and to hear such wonderful people like you express you, their strong love and their strong devotion to Bharatma. So, you, Ambassador Ji, on a related note, if I were to talk about, if I were to ask you about the quadrilateral security dialogue that India has entered into with the three other nations of the world, the USA, Japan, and Australia, how can we say that the world is aligning with India through the quad? And how is India being advantaged through the quadrilateral security dialogue? Well, I believe that you have asked a brilliant question. I understand that the Quad is making China quadriplegic. Now that Vietnam and the United Kingdom and Taiwan and South Korea and France and Germany want in on the action. Let me tell the millions of people watching this conversation. How did the Quad emerge? The Quadrilateral Security Dialogue. 2004 tsunami. We were the first to mobilize. Thereafter, the Australians joined in, the Americans did, the Japanese did, they all sent their navies to help. The UN took over and coordinated the rescue effort, but we realized in the first few days that we were all doing the same thing. If I sent drinking water to the Maldives, so did the Americans, so did the Japanese, so did the Australians, then the foreign secretaries, the heads of the ministries of foreign affairs of each of the four countries were in daily contact. And they said, okay, look, you do this, I'll do this, he'll do that. That then became crystallized into a kind of informal security dialogue. Let me just put it to you like this, that the Quad was created 
by an act of God, the tsunami. And it has been solidified by the act of a godless nation called China. Now, when Victor Hugo said many years ago, if an idea whose time has come appears, no power on earth can stop it. And I must tell you that the Quad, all three of our partners in it had sanctioned us in 1998 after our nuclear test. They are now our buddies. As Bob Dylan sang in the 1960s, the times, they are a changing. This applies in particular to the Indo-Pacific, the most active region in the global geopolitical landscape. Look, China cannot fight on multiple fronts all at the same time. Even the biggest bully gets exhausted after a while. No one trusts China anymore. China's relationships with each of the four Quad members, ha! Australia led the demand for an independent international inquiry into the origins of the virus. Mm -hmm. Furious, China sharply curtailed its imports from Australia and its sorry diplomats competed with each other to hurl abuse. One called Australia the white trash of Asia. Another called it chewing gum stuck to the boot of China. And then the anti-Chinese, uh, Japanese sentiment, you can see it in the more than 200 anti-Japanese war films produced and displayed in mainland China every year, even in 2020, 2021. 2017, following our standoff in Dolam with the Chinese, the Chinese state media, so sensitive to xenophobic slurs, they released a racist propaganda video accusing India of committing sins, featuring a Chinese actor in a Sikh turban speaking in a mock Indian accent. This is China. And then, of course, the state-owned China television network said that the virus is the Waterloo for America's leadership. Washington is tumbling to rock bottom over the coronavirus response. Then, of course, when the top diplomats from uh, America and China met in Alaska, uh, this was not so a few weeks ago, they were talking at each other, not to each other. They were hurling abuse. This is certainly not the language intended to win friends and influence people. I think Dale Carnegie wrote this classic in the 1930s. If there's no Mandarin version available, I'll send it to that ping pong fellow who runs China, how to win friends and influence people. This is not the way. The besetting sin of China's foreign policy is intellectual sclerosis. It has seen how foreign allies during the Cold War invariably succumbed to American blandishment. And the Communist Party wants to use that as a template for economic domination and military coercion. Whatever you might say about the American system, it remains the global dream. We have 245 million family units in India. And I don't know of one that doesn't have a son or a daughter or an uncle or an aunt or a relative or a village mate or a friend or a friend of a friend or a friend of a friend of a friend who is not in the United States. It's a every Indian's dream. I wonder how many people dream of wanting to settle down in China. China has tied itself up into knots. It is a dystopian state with an acute inability to tell the truth. Therefore, if we have the quadrilateral security dialogue, a grouping of regional like-minded democracies, Australia, Japan, India, and the US, and others wanting to come in, it's very, very clear that this is a warning to China. Some people say this is going to be an Asian NATO. Happy birthday. What's wrong with that? We don't want to call it NATO. Call it uh, IPTO, Indo-Pacific Treaty Organization. Call it... Uh, ATO, Asian Treaty Organization. How does it make a difference what you call it? The fact is it's there. And the glue that binds it is the lies, the deception, the thuggery, the treachery of China. Very rightly said, Ambassador Ji. China is definitely a threat to the modern world, which should be tackled and countered. And to itself. To itself, certainly. The Communist and Party, the Chinese people, I have no problem with them. It's the Communist Party that needs to be, be clobbered out sense. of existence. Certainly.
certainly very rightly put. And uh, Ambassador Ji, if we would shift focus to the unfortunate Gulwan incident that took place last year, what are some of the very important geopolitical insights that Indians can draw from that incident? Well, let me put it to you this way, for those who are familiar with what happened in uh, Galwan, that we have a certain arrangement. We had it with Pakistan in Kargil. We had it with China in Ladakh, in this area. And we had this informal arrangement that we'd patrol these areas, you patrol that area, the same thing which happened in Kargil. What happened then was that we found them surreptitiously trying to grab our territory. People say that China has a policy of salami slicing. Well, we have a policy of bacon busting. They tried to come in by stealth, by deception, talking sweet words, but then they intruded on our territory. They were not prepared for what faced them. We sent a patrol party there led by the colonel of the battalion, the commanding officer, to tell them that you better dismantle the structures that you have created because this is part of our agreement. They said yes. We found that a few hours later, a few days later, they had not. So we went back. And again, we were led by the colonel. We were carrying weapons. We didn't use them because that is the protocol. When he, we went and said, why haven't you done it? China, which, suppose, which is supposed to be a several trillion dollar economy, they had imported clubs which had barbed wire wrapped around them. They're going back to the Stone Age, these fellows, and they claim to be an ultra-modern part, and they started beating our fellows with that. You don't do that to the Indian Army. For those of you who understand the ethos of the Indian Army, they hit the colonel of the battalion. And when you do that, the colonel is the father of his soldiers. Then there was no way we could stop them. Our soldiers just absolutely retaliated with vengeance. We snapped the necks of the Chinese. We lost 20 of our brave sons in that confrontation, we gave them state funerals, national funerals. We honored them. The Chinese for eight months didn't even accept their casualties. What a country! So that the parents of the Chinese soldiers who died couldn't pray for their souls. They were not even told that their sons had been killed. Ultimately, they said four. Well, four people died, but we saw 41 helicopter flights taking your casualties. The figure that is internationally accepted is around a hundred. Having been taught a lesson, what did they do? They quickly changed all their commanders, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That doesn't work. One thing which is important: we hit back militarily, we hit back economically, we hit back culturally. You know, several Chinese apps were banned. Imports from China are expected to halve by the next one or two years. Yes, it's not going to be easy to decouple with China because once you've been in bed with someone for 30 years, not just in the whole world, the divorce doesn't take place in 24 hours. It's going to be a messy process, but it has started. No one, but no one, but no one trusts China. And we have seen now what is happening. They talk of their grand Belt and Road Initiative. Actually, it's a Bilk and Rob Initiative. They want to bilk and rob every country. And then they have the CPEC, the China-Pakistan exploitation, sorry, economic corridor. And people talk about that also. In reality, that is deader than a dodo. The dodo was that 16th century bird found in Mauritius that just went away because it was so dumb, as people say. So you have this expression that uh, the China's leader, Ping Pong, is dumber than a dodo, which he is indeed. But what we are seeing today is that the world is coming together to break the world's dependence on one factory of the world, which was China. India would never do this. China has done it with rare earths in the past, denied it to several countries, including the United States and Japan. In fact, I believe Japan took them to the World Trade Organization on more than one occasion. The World Trade Organization ruled against them and said, no, you have to supply this. Chinese said, oh, we are doing it to protect the environment. Oh, sorry, we are doing it to keep it for ourselves. Oh, sorry, we are doing it to control prices. These guys are crazy. They lie through their teeth and they expect the world to believe them. So I believe that the Galwan incident had an unintended repercussion, which is it showed the world the determination and the strength of India. Why unintended repercussion? I would urge you to read 
he was my professor in the United States, Robert Merton, famous American sociologist. He propagated or he really popularized the law of unintended consequences. You take a purposive action and it may have an unintended consequence. Ma'am, if I have a moment, let me give you an example. When the nation's capital shifted from Kolkata to Delhi in 1911, in the area where I live in the nation's capital, one of the most highly protected near the central part of Delhi, there were a lot of snakes. And so the British government, the then British government said, look, everybody who kills a snake and brings it to us is going to get two rupees or three rupees, a lot of money at that time. So suddenly a huge number of dead snakes started showing up. It is one way to control the snake population. Till the British government realized that people were rearing snakes in their backyard to kill them and sell them to the authorities for the money. So they promptly banned that practice, the government. What do you think the people who had been raising the snakes, what did they do? They released the snakes into the streets. So therefore, instead of going down, the population actually came up. It, this is the law of unintended consequences. The Chinese did not anticipate that when they unleashed their virus on the world, the whole world would go to get together to oppose them. They talk of the socialism with Chinese characteristics. They talk of development with Chinese characteristics. They never talk of truth with Chinese characteristics, which basically means no truth at all. Beautifully put, Ambassador Ji, wonderfully said. And definitely this is a fact that the Chinese Communist Party has unfortunately created for itself such a huge problem that the entire world has now joined forces to counter it and to battle its growing hegemony in this uh, 21st century. So uh, Ambassador Ji, you have a wonderful first hand accounts uh, of the UN peacekeeping missions in Africa. Could you please tell us a little about some of the most notable instances of the same? Let me just put it like this, that uh, at one point of time when I was your ambassador to Sudan and I was covering South Sudan, which was not then independent, subsequently it did in 2011, I was uh, asked if I would be interested in heading one of the UN missions. I took about two nanoseconds to say thank you, but no thank you, because I realized that these were a bit of a joke. I don't mean to criticize anybody, but in South Sudan, the feeling was that UN stands for unnecessary. These guys had no idea about what is required. These are all Western people, people from all over the world who come with their own templates about development. When I go somewhere, I'm special advisor to three countries in Africa, three heads of government. When they ask me, what would you do in a situation like this? I said, in my country or in this other country that I've experienced, of, this is what they did. However, you take a decision. You are the stakeholder. You are the boss. You are the leader. You are the decision maker. With the UN, it's different. They'll come and force their prescriptions down the throats of these fellows. They will live a life of relative luxury, even in the midst of grinding poverty. Let me tell you two incidents, ma'am, that shook me up. One, when I was in South Sudan, I used to go there very frequently. I still do. I haven't in 2020 because of travel restrictions, but I will resume as soon as the restrictions are limited. I was sitting down. I don't eat breakfast. And one fine day, I was sitting down to have lunch. And my four security guards had their noses pressed to the glass windows looking at me. So I called them in. I said, what's your problem? They said, sir, we haven't eaten in three days. So we were just looking at you eat. I said, take this food away. Take it to your family. The second time was once I'd gone with some South Sudanese tribal chiefs on, on a picnic arranged by the Indian Army. And we had a very meager uh, meal. And then they said, uh, could we take what's left over, particularly the oranges and apples, our children have never seen these. We'd like to take it for them. And at that moment, what could I say? I said, just take everything. Then I asked my military commander, I said, just send them a whole, several basket loads of this kind of stuff. No, man, I'm afraid today the credibility of the United Nations it is at its lowest. No one has any need for it. And it reminds me of what we used to say at the height of the Cold War. When the superpowers, I'm talking of the United States, and the Soviet Union, when they see eye to eye, the UN is pointless. When they don't see eye to eye, the UN is powerless. And at all other times, it is useless. 
that was the feeling that people had about the United Nations. Then it has to reinvent itself. There is no way that a country like India, the third largest economy in the world, the second largest population in the world, having contributed so many peacekeepers, so many sons of India have died for other countries in UN peacekeeping operations. There is no way that we should not have a very important role in its highest decision-making body, which is the United Nations Security Council. The architecture of 1945, when we were still a colony, and only 45 countries or whatever signed the original charter, we are now 193 members. The world has changed. The UN has not. Very rightly put, and the UN needs to remodel itself. It needs to accommodate the new changes of the growing world. It needs to rebuild its structure in order to, uh, in order to uh, adjust to the growing geopolitical developments that are taking Which place. Which it is not issue. doing. In fact, it mm. needs to will itself out of existence. We used to have a racket after the First World War called the League of Nations. It just died unsung, unlamented, unremembered. The UN will probably, should probably, this is a personal opinion, not that of my government, go the same way and a new organization be created that represents the will of the seven and a half billion people on our planet and of the 200 whatever countries or territories, etc. that we have. Certainly, sir. Absolutely. And uh, coming to the slightly different topic of your service as uh, uh, as an as an individual who's working really closely with the government in Ladakh. So, how has this experience been working alongside the Indian government in the territory of Ladakh? And well, in Ladakh, I'm a special advisor to the Autonomous Hill Development Council. Ma'am, in remote areas, and, and what we say in Ladakh is that we are so remote, so difficult, that only our best friends or our worst enemies will ever come here. But it is spectacularly beautiful. There are three things which I've uh, experienced and which I've also suggested for development of remote areas in the three African countries that I'm privileged to serve. The first and most important thing is education, because without that, it becomes very, very difficult. So what we did was that we took a lot of Ladakhi children, brought them to different universities. We set up schools and colleges in Ladakh. We focus on education. The second important thing for us is employment generation through small scale industry. For example, Kargil is the apricot capital of the world. Absolutely the best apricots in the world are available in Kargil. The people would dry them, put them in sacks, send them across the country and get nothing for their effort. Now we have set up units there that package them so that they have a long shelf life and they are now being sent wherever they are meant to be sent. So income generation becomes extremely important because it gives you employment through small and medium scale industry that use locally available resources. And the third is health. Without health, you can't do anything. So we've set up a lot of uh, medical centers, primary healthcare centers, hospitals, etc. And a lot of my friends, I'm delighted to say, we are such a wonderful people, we Indians are. Lots of them sponsor trips by medical teams from the nation's capital, from other big cities to Ladakh, and they are there for two weeks, three weeks, four weeks. They help the local people. Plus, the Indian Army, the best in the universe, has opened its medical facilities to the people of Ladakh. So they are today very, very happy to be part of India. I had been told that, you know, they don't really think that they are part of India. Let me assure you, ma'am, to the millions of people watching this conversation, whenever I go there, the normal greeting we have in Ladakh is Jule. Jule means hello, goodbye, how are you? It means everything. But when I talk to them, when I say Jule, their response is Jai Hind. And every conversation I have, it and every sentence is, Haan, sir, ye jarur karenge, Jai Hind. Sir, bilkul theek hai, no problem, Jai Hind. Everything is Jai Hind. Har saas bole Jai Hind. Har dil ki dharkan bole Jai Hind. Har muh se nikle Jai Hind. This is what Ladakh is all about. Isn't that beautiful, Ambassador Ji, to know that the Ladakhi people have such unrelentless unre and unflinching patriotism for their country? Oh, they have so much. I talked to some fellow who's 35 years old or 30 years old. I said, look, 20 years ago, 22 years ago, when we had this Kargil conflict, what did you do? You were then 10 years. Saab, apni peach pe rakke, khana le gaya tha Indian army ke liye. The pride with which they say it. You know, this is 
something that we need to highlight. Yes, there are two kinds of people in the world. There are people like you and I am. We have a positive outlook and there are others whom I call tormented souls. These are the fellows who even hanged Isa Masi or assassinated Mahatma Gandhi because they are unhappy. They are born unhappy. There's nothing you can do about that. They will see negative in everything. And as I was circulating a message today, I uh, did a COVID test two days ago, the uh, RT-PCR. And my doctor said, well, I better tell you that you are double negative. I said, what does that mean? He said, one, you are negative. And second, you are so positive all the time that you are also, <laughs> the virus has run away from you. It doesn't come anywhere near you. So you are double negative. Well, thank you very much. That's a compliment. I accept it. That's wonderful to know. And uh, Ambassador Ji, so you have spoken at length about how the Ladakhi people have shown such tremendous cooperation with the Indian government and they consider India their motherland like they definitely should and the, and, uh, the immeasurable love they have for their country. And so I would like to ask you now that in relation to the experience that you have had in Ladakh and with regards to the UN peacekeeping missions in Africa, what has been your experience with regards to the uh, prime ministers of Lesotho, uh, South Sudan and uh, the, uh, uh, the Guinea-Bissau uh, country that you serve as a special advisor to? Uh, you've asked me a question that I would have to respond to very carefully because I don't wish to say anything that might be offensive to some people. In the three countries, in Guinea-Bissau in particular, and I really like that country, one of my childhood heroes, actually when I was a young man in college, was a chap called Amir Kar Cabral. He led the fight in Guinea-Bissau and Cape Verde against the Portuguese. He had even visited India. I heard him speak. His eldest daughter, by the way, uh, he named her Indra in uh, tribute to our prime minister. When I go there, the only thing that I find as far as India is concerned is total love, total affection. They all know Mahatma Gandhi. They all know what we have achieved. They know our IT prowess. They know our medical prowess. And whenever they've needed help, we've given it to them. We funded some projects there. They're very, very pleased. South Sudan, what they tell us is, we do know who our best friend in the world is. It's India. I made so many trips to South Sudan. I don't mind sharing this with you. When I was ambassador in Sudan for five years, I probably went over 100 times to the south. It was then the semi-autonomous region of Southern Sudan. And one day, a very senior Sudanese official met me somewhere and says, Ambassador, because they are also a, a police state, they were, said, you've been visiting South Sudan very frequently, why? And I said, sir, I respond to my government, not to you. If they question me, I will tell them, and don't you dare ask me this question again. He immediately apologized, said, I'm sorry. Then you've asked about the kingdom of Lesotho, the kingdom in the sky, absolutely beautiful. The Prime Minister is a wonderful man. It's a very complicated country. Their political system is extremely complicated. They have a direct vote and then they have a proportional vote and all kinds of funny things go on. And they keep changing governments faster than I change my night suits. But what really I found in that country again is the enormous goodwill for India. And in these three countries, South Sudan, Lesotho, and Guinea-Bissau, the number of their students whom we have funded who have come to study in India, so many of them, nine out of 10 probably, have expressed a desire to return because we are an open society. We are a welcoming society. We're a non-racist society. And you know this philosophy that all of us have, Nishada, Atiti Dev Bhava, doesn't matter what the color of the Atiti is. When he's in trouble, we reach out to help. In many ways, I tell my American friends that we are like you. We do the right thing after we've done everything else. 
That is wonderful to know, Ambassador Ji. The fact, I mean, I myself was unaware, and I think even the viewers of this channel might be really unaware of the love that we get, love the Indian people and the Indian country gets from the people of Africa, particularly the countries that you serve as a special advisor to. The love, the love was there and would be there irrespective of my role. That they decided to uh, give me this privilege. One of the prime minister, I asked him, you know, the prime ministers, I said, sir, you could have got anybody. Why me? Uh, you had, you know, you could have got a German or a Swiss or a French or an Englishman or whatever. He said, I selected you because you are Indian. What could be a greater tribute to my mother? How Her beautiful. name is India than this. Yeah. How beautiful was that? And so, therefore, Ambassador Ji, my final question to you is this, that you have, uh, your wonderful thoughts have envisaged a, a, a notion of mega con convergence by the year 2025. So could you tell our viewers a little bit about that as to what this concept of, of this Mega convergence is the is. world getting together to make sure that we never fail, uh, face a concentrated mammoth catastrophic health crisis as we have seen. The second thing is that we'll make sure that development remains on our agenda and no single country is allowed to block it. And the third we would do is that climate change, all of us are now coming together to say, guys, we better get our act together. Otherwise, the planet as we know it will change. Mishada, we do not own Earth we have only borrowed it from our children. And Very we have true. to give them, we have to build for ourselves a better world to live in and to give to our children a better world to inherit. India is doing this. And that's so heartening to hear, Ambassador Ji, to know that our country is at the forefront of leading this battle against climate change and serving not just uh, this world, but also to ensure that it gets it sustained and it's nurtured uh, just like Mother Earth nurtured us for thousands of years. And now we are just returning the favor. So Because we have a 10,000 year old history. We talk of Vasudeva Kutumkan. The world is one family. Ye tera hai, ye mera hai, ye uska hai, ye iska hai. These are thoughts of small minds. We have shared resources. We have shared ideas. We have shared technologies. And above all, India has always been the biggest proponent of shared humanity. Certainly, and we will continue to do so. We will continue to project and to profess and practice these thoughts with the plot and with assurance. I conclude with just one remark that if I get a chance to meet my maker, because in a few years I will leave my body, and he asked me, what do you want? I'll ask for three things, Mishada. First, may I be born in India again. Second, may I become an ambassador of India again. And third, give me another chance to speak on Festival of Bharat. Thank you very much, Mishada. Thank you very much. May and God always be with you. Together, we can, we will, we are. Definitely, we can, we will, and we are. And with this, I would like to genuinely thank you, uh, Ambassador Ji, for joining us on our show. We are very obliged and we're extremely honored to have you here on our platform. Thank you so much and Jai Hind. Jai Hind. Vande Matram. Vande Matram. Mm -hmm. Namaste. We hope you enjoyed this Chitti Media content. Please remember to subscribe to us and switch on the notifications for this channel. For our other social media links, more content and to support our work, please visit citti.net. Dhanavad. Namaskar.